A very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this virtual media roundtable of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka, part of the region's most prestigious and industry leading Property Guru Asia Property Awards series, the gold standard in real estate. We're very honored to host you today and hope you will receive valuable insights and tips from our speakers today as we talk about navigating the Sri Lanka real estate industry through the COVID-19 pandemic. Please uh, give me a moment to introduce myself. I'm sure Amma Screen is joining you as your moderator for the roundtable for today. Before we kick off our session, we'd like to first thank our partners for their valuable support for this year. Uh, official supervisor, HLB, official magazine, Property Guru Property Report, official cable TV partner, History Channel, official newspaper, Daily FT, supporting association, Salon Institute of Builders, official PR partner, PRY Consultancy, official charity partner, Right to Play, official S ESG partner, Bandec Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us and for partnering with us in this very important session. Just some ground rules for you before we uh, hand you over to our speakers and our for our session for today. If you have any questions during the presentation, which is in the first half of this two hour webinar that we are hosting for today, please feel free to type them in the question box in your chat. There's a QA section in your chat box. You can leave in your question there. Towards the rest of our round table, there will be a QA session, the question and answer session. Once all the speakers have finished their presentations, uh, we will be happy to address you at that point. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please give me a moment to introduce you to our panelists for today. Very honored to have with us the Managing Director of Property Guru Asia Property Awards and Events, Mr. Jules K, Director and CEO of Paramount Reality Incorporation and Chairperson of the Judging Panel, Dr. Nirmal De Silva, also uh, the Property Guru Asia Property Awards to uh, Sri Lanka 2021, uh, part of the judging panel that is. And we're also joined by the founding director and CEO of RIU Real Estate Intelligence Unit and the judging panel of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka 2021. We have Mr. Roshan Madhavala who is joining us for today's session. We're also joined by the CEO and Director of RNH Group of Companies, NH and Company, uh, HLB Sri Lanka, the official supervisor of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka, Mr. Dinuk Hetiarachi. And we have the Director of Finance and Planning, Marga Engineering, winner of the Special Recognition in Sustainable Development Property Guru Asia Property Awards 2018, uh, Mr. Mega Kularatna. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here today for a very valuable and insightful session. And we're off to kick off today's session without further ado. Let's hear from our very first speaker, the Managing Director of Property Guru Asia Property Awards and Events, Mr. Jules K. We'd like to hear about this year's award ceremony and what's in store. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. And good morning and welcome everybody to this special virtual event held officially to launch the Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka 2021. Um, today's virtual roundtable has been specially created by the team at Property Guru, and not only to explain the awards, but also to provide some insights into the current and future status of Sri Lanka's real estate market. So before I dive a little deeper into the regional awards process, I would like to personally thank all of our speakers for giving their valuable time and sharing their knowledge and insights today. Thank you all very much. Next slide, please. And even the next slide. So a little bit about the Property Guru Asia Property Awards. Over the last 16 years, uh, the Property Guru Asia Property Awards have grown and diversified to cover 12 plus countries in the Asia Pacific region. And the awards now help set a quality benchmark for regional real estate development and design. We run a series of national awards programs, which begin next month. And these will go until the end of the year culminating in our annual Asia Property Awards Grand Final in December, which brings together the top developers and projects from across the region to celebrate the best of the best in regional real estate. 
The judging process for the awards is independent, consistent, fair and transparent. And with additional credibility added by official supervisor, HLB, who we will hear from later in today's webinar. So simply put, the Property Guru Asia Property Awards represent the gold standard in Asian real estate. And we're very proud to include Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan real estate market in this regional series. Next slide, please. So a quick look back at 2020. Obviously the pandemic presented us with challenges, but in terms of coverage and participation, the Asia Property Awards last year continued to lead the way as the region's most prominent, credible and prestigious real estate awards series. To ensure the safety of our participants, we switched to a virtual gala format in many of the countries where we normally hold physical events. And this actually proved very successful as it extended the reach of the Property Awards online, where we welcomed around half a million viewers from China to Singapore, from Sri Lanka to Australia. And this year, we will once again be live streaming all of our awards galas online to ensure that not only property developers and industry experts are involved, but also that we reach agents, investors, and importantly, home buyers to give them a clear view of the best properties and opportunities on offer around the Asia region. Next slide, please. So for property developers wishing to enter the biggest, most respected industry event in the Asia Pacific region, it's a straightforward process. Nominations are possible in a wide variety of categories, including developer categories, development for projects, and design awards. The entries are submitted online, along with supporting information, images, and video. And then our independent judges in each of the countries where we operate, review the submissions and discuss the merits of each project and company based on criteria we have developed throughout our 16 year history with the awards running through many different iterations. To support their deliberations, the judges also conduct either physical or virtual site visits. This means they review the actual projects as well as the photos and information submitted with the entry. Then after the deliberations, the official supervisor, HLB, verifies the final shortlist of winning entries, which is then announced to the industry and the public online and through many of our good attendees today, the press. The winners and highly commended companies and projects from Sri Lanka will be given the opportunity to compete at regional level against their peers from countries such as Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, and Vietnam. In 2019, the title of Best Mixed Use Development Asia was awarded to the One Colombo, an iconic transformation of Transwork Square in your capital. Next slide, please. So right after our regional grand final, Property Guru also holds the annual Property Guru Asia Real Estate Summit. This is when thought leaders from around the world, as well as tech innovators, groundbreaking designers, and seasoned investors share their expertise on the future of the real estate industry in terms of its design, development, and investment across the region. This Asia Pacific Real Estate Summit and Grand Final will both be hosted virtually this year, once again, to ensure the safety of participants. But we will live stream broadcast the conference and the Grand Final across the region to highlight the best of Asia. These are the dates for your diary. The Real Estate Summit will take place on Wednesday, the 8th of December, and the Asia Property Awards Grand Final Virtual Awards Ceremony will be on Thursday, the 9th of December. We are proud to feature Sri Lanka in the Property Guru Asia Property Awards 2021, and we look forward to recognizing the country's best developers and projects once again this year. So thank you once again for joining us. We look forward to a successful season of awards.
Thank you very much uh, to the Managing Director of Property Guru Asia Property Awards and Events, Mr. Jules K, for taking us through those very valuable insights. And I'm sure everyone is excited now to find out how this year's competition is going to be. We would now like to invite Dr. Nirmal De Silva, the Property Guru Asia Property Award Sri Lanka Chairperson, on the view or the overview of the Asia Property Award Sri Lanka. Um, Dr. Nirmal, hope you're keeping well. Over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I want to all of you all, thank you for joining today this live uh, virtual media roundtable. It's indeed an honor once again to serve uh, as the chairperson for the independent ju judging panel of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards 2021 edition. Uh, before I go into the slides, I would like to take a few minutes to just give a bit of an overview of the Sri Lankan market and the prospects uh, that we see from a Sri Lankan perspective. As we are all aware, post-war Sri Lanka, we have seen dramatic developments in the infrastructure and real estate space in the Sri Lankan uh, industry. We've also seen Colombo skyline as well as the suburban development changing rapidly uh, day by day. And like most advocates argue, Sri Lanka can be the next growth haven of South Asia. Uh, and there are fundamental reasons for that. Our strategic location, our knowledgeable and skilled workforce, uh, and our relative easiness of doing business in Sri Lanka compared to some of our, our closest neighbors, all make it really an attractive location, both from a business perspective and from a, a leisure perspective. Consistently, the government of Sri Lanka have been looking at relaxing fiscal policy by reducing taxes, which has further encouraged more and more investment in the real estate space. Typically due to COVID-19 and the resultant macroeconomic uh, situation, there has been a relaxation of the monetary policy. Today we are at single digit interest rates, which have made uh, investment in real estate much more lucrative uh, than any other fixed income instrument like a fixed deposit or a savings account. So we've seen a lot of positives coming in from economic perspective towards Sri Lankan real estate. Also, Sri Lanka has been constantly voted by multiple forums as one of the best places to travel, uh, which means once this pandemic ends, there is more and more opportunities for people to visit and invest in Sri Lanka. So that's a quick overview of what the Sri Lankan market is, uh, the potential. Uh, I firmly believe that Sri Lanka has every ingredient to be the next growth haven of South Asia. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of time and I think the industry players in the real estate uh, segment, starting from developers have played a very pivotal role uh, amidst challenging and turbulent economic times uh, over the last three years to come up with some of the best of the best projects. And as Jules very rightly mentioned, a uh, few of Sri Lankan projects have gone to be the best in Asia uh, in this most prestigious uh, awards uh, ceremony. So I think uh, we can definitely benchmark against our peers uh, and rub our shoulders with the industry space. And the Property Guru Asia Property Awards have always been a wonderful platform for real estate developers to showcase their true ab abilities, capabilities, and skill set. So we are now celebrating the fifth edition. Uh, uh, unfortunately, due to various situations, we couldn't have a physical uh, award ceremony in Sri Lanka. However, uh, Property Guru Asia Property Awards have been really supportive of the growth narrative of Sri Lanka, looking at the potential, and have always encouraged uh, at, at the grand finale uh, held over the last few years to recognize the best of Sri Lankan real estate. And there is no doubt, I tend to agree, it is indeed the gold standard in real estate and it gives every developer, everybody uh, who is part of the ecosystem to really showcase their ability and talent uh, to a global scale. Next slide, please. So, before I get into the award categories, I would also like to say that the entire process I've been involved over the last five years with Property Guru Asia Property Awards. And one thing I can say quite humbly 
uh, is that the awards is credible, it's process oriented, and, and the recognition is beyond par. So there is a very stringent policy that we adopt. I'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, so if you are a award winner, if you are recognized as a award winner, which means you've really gone through a very stringent and top-notch benchmarking process. Next slide, please. Yeah, so by far and large, we have a number of categories that uh, Sri Lankan developers can showcase their uh, work. So we got developer awards, we got special recognition awards, uh, looking at areas like sustainable design, construction, special recognition in ESG. Then we have the other development awards in terms of uh, things like best luxury condo, uh, median condo development. Uh, and then we have at different provincial levels as well, Colombo, Southern, Central, Northeast, etc. Also, when you look at the commercial real estate side, we are looking at best office development uh, categories, uh, retail development, hospitality or hotel development, boutique hotel development, mixed use development, etc. Now, there is no better opportunity to showcase uh, your work if there is no design categories. And we have a wonderful range of design categories as well, where it comes uh, in the form of condo architecture, housing architecture, office, retail, mixed development, landscape, and even a very interesting category in the co-working space as well, which goes to show that it's not only the gold standard, but by far and large, it is indeed the, the trendsetter when it comes to recognizing the, the best of real estate uh, in the region. And then we have the best of the best awards, and then we have a publisher's choice, which is the real estate personality of the year. So if you really look at it, if you are a developer, I'm pretty sure there are multiple categories in which you can um, submit your entries and then possibly uh, be a winner of this based on the work that and the hard work that you have put in. Next, please. So we have a typical timeline in terms of uh, how this works. We have the entries are going to be open on the first, uh, or at least it has opened on the 1st of January, 2021. We are hoping to close entries on the 24th of September. So you got a few more months in which you can submit your entries. Site inspections, uh, where all the uh, judging panel will go and visit your site. So it's not just going to be on a, on a document or on a virtual tour. We'll be physically making site inspections. At times we've gone twice or thrice uh, to visit those sites, requested for more information from the developer. Then on the 11th of October, the final judging uh, process will take place. Uh, with past experience, I can tell you, it's not easy to judge uh, a fair number of uh, entries because every developer in Sri Lanka has put in a lot of hard work. So it is a very tough process. Uh, and then we will be recognizing the best of the best at the virtual gala event on the 9th of December. So that's pretty much in a nutshell on how the uh, timeline and the milestones for the award category works. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to take just a few minutes more to discuss about the overall process in terms of how the judging works. I talked about the credibility of the judging process. So once the entries are submitted, the first thing that every judge needs to do is to submit their uh, conflict of interest documentation, if at all, to HLB or to UKTRHC's team, um, basically to ensure that none of the judging panel has any conflict of interest when it com comes to giving their independent opinion. So in that sense, there is definitely an industry standard and definitely there is a proper process. Thereafter, once we get a short list of all uh, entries, as I mentioned earlier, we will be having site visits uh, and we'll be covering each and every category uh, that has entered. Uh, so there is no easy way out in the entire process. Uh, and it's not just based on a submission of a document 
as I mentioned earlier as well. Thereafter, there is a lot of debates which goes on between the judging panel on the reasons for it, the methodology, and why a particular project should be better than the other. And that's all moderated and also looked into by the independent auditor for the property awards. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a tough process, which is why it's the gold standard uh, in the industry when it comes to recognizing real estate projects. Uh, and I'm quite happy to be part and parcel of this over the last few years. I need to thank my fellow judging panel who has put you know, enormous amount of time and effort uh, in this entire process. And uh, once again, I thank uh, Property Guru for really uh, looking after Sri Lanka, guiding us and molding us during this entire process over the last five years. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal. Thank you for taking us through the importance of having the Asia Property Awards here in Sri Lanka, the judging process, uh, and I'm sure everyone is eagerly excited to apply now. Uh, but before that, we thought we'll take you through the impact of the COVID-19 and a few observations from the overseas market as well. And to give you a better overview, joining us today is Mr. Roshan Madavala. Good morning to you, sir. Hi, good morning, Sharon. Good morning, everybody. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Jules and the Asia Property team for organizing this um, event. Um, so to start with, uh, we need to understand the impact of COVID on the economy as a whole, uh, but we... Roshan, are you with us? Roshan? Seems like we're having a bit of a technical issue. Um, Roshan, I just want to check one more time. Are you there with us? Technology can be a little jealous over at times. So this is one of those moments. All right, we'll move on to our next speaker until we get Roshan back in line. Um, joining us next is Mr. Dinuk Hetiarachi from the RNH Group of Companies, HLB, the official supervisor. We're going to know what HLB is all about and to take us through why it is important for the Property Guru Asia Property Awards to have a trusted official supervisor. Dinuk, good morning. Good morning, Sharon. How are you? Am I audible clearly? Yes, we are good to go. Great. Good morning, everybody, and it is, it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to be part of this program and this award ceremony. And uh, my role here is to represent uh, HLB International as a supervisor of the awards of the judging process. And in the next few slides, um, I will take you through a little background about who we are and what we do and how we will get involved in the process of judging uh, during the Property Awards 2021. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I will go through a session overview of um, uh, HLB International, what HLB International does, uh, the official supervisor, um, the judging process, and the overall judging criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, one more. All right. So HLB International was founded in 1969 
Uh, it is a global network of advisory and accounting firms. We, are, we operate in 159 countries with close to 1,000 officers worldwide and over 32,000 people within the network. So we are, a, we are a, a very active and a dynamic, energetic uh, association of advisory and accounting personalities, which has helped us actually to uh, take the group HLB International to great places. Next slide, please. We are currently ranked the 11th uh, global network in the world. And recently, which was a feather in our cap, we were nominated the best, net, or the, rather the network of the year 2020 by International Accounting, which is in, indeed a great achievement and speaks highly about the activities HLB International has been doing within the recent past. Next slide, please. Like I explained earlier, we have a global reach. Uh, we have officers in North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East and Asia Pacific. And on the slide, you would see the number of countries we represent in each continent and the officers we have in each of these continents. Next slide. So in Sri Lanka, HLB International is represented by our own very firm, Nihal Hittarachi and Company, Chartered Accountants. Um, we, we do have two sister companies under this uh, umbrella, which is HLB Lanka Business Advisory and Vijay Ratna and Company, which is a third generation audit firm, which is also now under our, our umbrella. Next slide, please. To give a little background into our firm, uh, we, we, have, we, has, we were established in 1984. Currently, we have 10 partners, over 300 qualified and part qualified staff within the network, over 1,000 local and global clients, and located in the heart of Colombo with a branch office in the south part of Colombo in Gaul. And we also do represent uh, HLB in Maldives. We were nominated as the audit firm of the year in the medium category in 2016. And we have been actively, we, have, we, would, be, we would call ourselves the largest local and auditing and accounting firm in Sri Lanka at the moment. Next slide, please. So what do we do? Uh, we are a fully full service uh, audit firm. Uh, we are into audit and assurance, tax advisory, management, and consultancy, risk advisory, outsourcing, corporate finance, and company secretarial services. This is generally the full gamut of services a professional accounting and auditing services company can offer to our clients. Next slide. These are some of our major clients, just to give an idea on, on the local, global, and government sector and private sector companies, which we uh, provide services for the last 35 years. Next slide, please. Right, so getting back uh, directly with regard to the Property uh, Guru Awards, uh, our role as a supervisor is to make sure that we judge this entire process and make sure that the process is fair without any bias and favor to any party. That's one of our main roles to ensure that there is, there is, been, there is transparency within the process. I think Nirmal ex, uh, explained uh, during his presentation as well. So our role would be mainly to ensure that the process is smooth uh, and we will be representing ourselves at every judging me uh, judges meetings. We will try to uh, send one of our representatives for all the site visits, when the site visits happen. And also we'll, we will be in charge of tabulating all the uh, scores and in, uh, making sure that the tabulation process is also done fairly and justly. Next slide, please. 
So let me explain to you the overall judging criteria in a little bit more detail uh, so that you get an idea on what are the uh, areas that we, we will be looking into. Uh, there are uh, the developer awards. We will be looking into the reputation, image, environment, social and governance factors, corporate social responsibility factors, quality of projects, track record, innovation and major achievements. So those are the criteria. This has been set by an independent judging panel and our role is to make sure that the, we, we stick by these guidelines. Uh, with regard to development awards, again, design, amenities and location, value for money, use of space, construction and materials, unique selling points, state of completion and sales success. With regard to design awards, we will look into the use of space, design concept and innovation, amenities, construction and materials, state of completion, sales success, site layout, internal layout, and sustainable function. So these are just uh, the criteria which are set by the panel of judges and we, our role would be to make sure that we will uh, go through these processes fairly. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, the process uh, has a few stages. Initially, we will have our first judges meeting uh, where the categories, criteria, the new judges and uh, the discuss and confirm. We have actually had that already. And now we'll be moving to the second uh, judges meeting where all entries will be reviewed against the criteria, of course. And after the discussion in the presence of the official supervisor, that's us, an initial long list up to about seven entr entrants per category will be agreed upon. And all the judges will provide the official supervisor with a signed form declaring any conflict of interest. This is the part which Nirmal was referring to during his presentation with the entrants and excuse themselves from any related categories. Then comes the site inspection, three to five person local judging uh, the, the judging panel will part participate in the site inspection. Um, there would be some central judging uh, panel members joining in, but I, that all depends on the on the logistical environment. We have been, especially with the challenges posed with COVID-19. Um, we will uh, uh, visit and meet the senior executives of, of all the uh, entrants, and then score sheets will be prepared. Uh, based on those sites inspections. Then the compilation of the score sheets will happen. And then the, uh, we, we, the judging panel will send their official to, to us. Uh, and then the central panel of judges to make sure that the uh, tabulation is done and finalized. Then we do have the final judges meeting, the central panel and the local panel will agree upon the final shortlist, which comprises of one winner and up to four highly commended companies. One, only one winner is selected for the best developer category. The official supervisor then reviews and approves the final shortlist and forward to the organizer to announce the shortlist first. The winners and highly commended are revealed only at a gala event and hopefully with the COVID restrictions easing off in the next few months. Fingers crossed, we should have a gala event uh, and celebrate the winners. Next slide, please. Yes, so that brings me to the end of uh, a little background about who we are, what HLB does, and what we as a local firm representing HLB, what we will be doing, and our process, and how we will be involved uh, during the process of judging. And once again, in closing, uh, it has been an honor to be nominated on this judging panel as official supervisor. And we will make sure and strive to do our best and to ensure that every applicant and entrant will have a fair, fair hearing or rather a fair uh, judging process during the Property Awards 2021. Thank you and over to you, Sharon.
Thank you very much, Mr. Tiarachi from the RNH Group of Companies, HR, the official supervisor, uh, speaking on the importance of credibility, fair and transparency. These are three important factors and winning a gold standard is what we promise to deliver. Uh, we're happy to have back Mr. Roshan Madhavala, who is joining us here once again, the founding director and CEO of our Real Real Estate Intelligence Unit and the judging panel of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards uh, Sri Lanka 2021. So we can hear you loud and clear now. Hi, hi. Actually, I'm not sure when uh, the, the connection uh, disconnected. Um, it was during the first slide itself, yeah. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. So I'm not a fan of the new normal, just for the record. And this is one of the reasons why. Um, so, all right. So basically, going back to the impacts of COVID uh, on the economy. We can note that uh, last year was the worst on record in Sri Lanka for um, as long as I can remember, certainly in the last 22 years, uh, where the economy contracted by 3.6%, um, which is very significant. And it has also triggered uh, many challenges for the economy in terms of uh, you know, sovereign debt, even though to the great credit of the government, they have been paying back all their loans, et cetera. Um, the macroeconomic conditions do nevertheless give a lot of rise for concern on uh, future ability to continue to repay um, the debts. So at a macroeconomic level, level, there are concerns on that. There's concerns on the foreign exchange, uh, the foreign currency effect, um, et cetera. So it has triggered many issues which are there uh, in terms of the structure of the Sri Lankan economy. Uh, on the positive side, I think this year, the economy is forecasted to grow by 5.5%, uh, even though uh, we may see that change as we proceed during this year. Uh, too many uncertainties. Essentially, we had wave one, which is really under control last year. Um, Sri Lanka was kind of hailed as uh, the place where COVID was under control. And then unfortunately, wave two hit uh, in uh, around July, August, uh, which was somewhat managed. Uh, but then wave three this year has, um, has put a different spin on things. So whereas previously, um, we could be, you know, um, a case study of a country that has controlled COVID, whereas now with wave three, that might be a little bit hard to convince people. Um, looking at the real estate space, essentially, um, we will uh, take each one separately because it's interesting to note that the impact on the different real estate segments has been um, a lot of contrast between uh, what COVID has done for, say, residential retail, uh, land prices and commercial. So taking residential first, um, developers have been telling us that things have been okay. Things have been good. Uh, sales have been steady, uh, which is great news. And uh, there are a number of reasons for this. I think the most important and significant reason for that is the government took a very bold step to slash interest rates by, um, can't remember the exact amount, but I think you know it's uh, the interest rates currently are at an unprecedentedly low level for Sri Lanka, which, which if you are a real estate developer, uh, is amazing news. So that has been a real shot in the arm um, for the residential sector, uh, which has been a saving grace. And as I said, most developers in the residential sector have been saying things are good. Some have even said things are good as they have ever been, whereas others have said we're steady, we're, we're making progress. However, let me just um, update you on that because I think the feeling is that the wave three was beginning to take its effect, um, even with the resilience um, of the residential developers that they've shown. We do feel that the impact on deal closure, which happens with the, the last lockdown, which was in effect for the last uh, four to six weeks. Uh, we feel that even the residential sector was starting to feel the pinch. Uh, okay, let's look at retail. 
It's been terrible news, not just since COVID, but the previous year as well, because if you recall, there was a horrible terror incident uh, in April 2029, when uh, following which tourism slumped close to zero. Uh, Sri Lanka was in the news all over the world, and there again, uh, retailers were hit. And they've never really bounced back for the last 2.5 years or whatever. So they, they have told us that things are tough, uh, it's a survival game, uh, and actually um, this, the retailers, many of these retail brands are set up for tourism uh, to, to piggyback on the growth that was forecasted for tourism over these years. So many of these have really suffered. On the other hand, some retail outlets have switched. They've gone onto online platforms where, where they have managed to make a switch and they're, they're doing fairly okay. Um, likewise, the residential, I forgot to mention, many of the developers told us that uh, they use this time to really strengthen and build their online presence. Uh, and, and that's something they, they have all said they have made a lot of progress in. So um, coming back to retail and hospitality has been very tough. Uh, these guys are not really expecting anything big to happen this year. Uh, even next year, um, uh, you know, is, is tinged with a lot of uncertainty and people really think that 2023 is the year when they can start to feel some normality again. Uh, I'm just saying these things because I'm sharing the findings from a survey that my team, uh, RIU team has done. We've spoken to some 35 business leaders uh, covering all categories and and this is kind of like the latest feedback on uh, kind of like the pulse of the business leaders in Sri Lanka. So um, moving to commercial, uh, in a nutshell, it's been very challenging, but to the great credit of the grade A and B developers, they managed to keep their occupancy levels pretty much at the same level uh, if you take buildings uh, individually. And that has been done through a, a massive amount of uh, negotiations with existing tenants, giving uh, grace periods, uh, extending uh, various kinds of concessions. However, uh, they have, for the most part, held to price. So they haven't negotiated on the price, but they have been flexible with many aspects of the lease agreements. On the whole, land prices in Colombo have dipped slightly. Uh, um, there have been false reports that land prices have been galloping along uh, like they have in the last five years. That, according to our research, is completely incorrect. Uh, according to our Colombo index, as Colombo 1 to 15, the average price per perch dipped from 11.62 million last year to 11.45 million this year. So lands in Colombo have traditionally been extremely resilient. Uh, even during the war, land prices were going up by five, six, seven percent. But at the moment, this last year, we've seen that uh, just about hold steady, uh, which is not too bad when you consider that we were on a, uh, a very good incline for the last seven, eight years. The business environment on the whole, um, what we find and what we've heard from, uh, from the business leaders is that uh, it's been challenging if you're a developer. We, most of the developers have had to endure delays in construction. Uh, if you are in the marketing and sales side, you've had to deal with various delays in deal closure uh, because of lockdowns, etc. cetera. Um, the airport has been closed for large uh, time periods during the last one and a half years. And that obviously de delays uh, the diaspora who are very important, account for about 30% of apartment sales uh, and tier one and tier two. So that has interrupted the flow of uh, business. Uh, many, uh, for example, hospitality uh, owners of buildings have uh, switched, leased their buildings for hospitals and other purposes. Some have gone into the quarantine um, business. Uh, so having personally traveled out twice during COVID, last year I had an experience which was um, uh, not as pleasant uh, being quarantined for two weeks, but a few weeks ago when I returned uh, from an overseas trip, I went to level one quarantine, which was uh, comparably a much more pleasant experience. 
uh, you basically can stay in a hotel for two weeks, uh, enjoy the facilities, etc. And uh, we hear that the government's very keen to push tourism this year, uh, probably a level one tourism followed by opening out. And, and I think if you've been vaccinated, uh, there's a different um, set of rules when you do visit Sri Lanka. So um, that's something that uh, many hoteliers have used to survive, as well as extending very uh, reasonable uh, hotel rates uh, during the times that the lockdown wasn't in effect in the last 18 months. Um, as I said, many businesses have really um, focused on building their digital presence during this time. Uh, most people have told us they, that they look forward to the impact of the port city. Uh, it's of course a very long-term impact, but they believe uh, the net impact of port city will be an uh, increase in FDI which ultimately will help the industry as a whole. Um, not sure how much time I have, but I just share a few quick notes from, uh, so we opened an office in Dhaka, Bangladesh last year. Uh, Bangladesh has been doing quite well, despite COVID is one of the fastest growing economies. Uh, and they pretty much managed to withstand COVID. Um, and we've noticed that in Dhaka itself, there has been a increase in demand for small apartments with the work from home culture really spreading. We've seen that uh, also being noted in the sales where people are demanding these little apartments that offer you uh, a better work from home environments. Um, and on the whole, they've been fairly resilient um, in Dhaka. Maldives, again, um, they started off well this year uh, with tourism because they have the natural ability to have quarantining in their islands. And they were very successful initially. Uh, they were actually reached about 50% of a normal year of tourism, which is amazing uh, during these times when no other country was anywhere close. But the latest we hear is, I uh, was speaking to them yesterday, uh, is that some of the countries have now uh, restricted Maldives. So um, and there's been a third wave. So again, that is being hit. UK, uh, where we have an office, obviously we've been monitoring things there. The government has not handled it great initially, but this year they have used uh, various uh, levels of lockdown and currently things are uh, halfway there to be normal. Um, so on the whole, I was asked to um, find best lessons, best practice, lessons from around the world. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any. I believe the uh, pandemic has still taken everyone by surprise. Uh, we don't really know what's happening next. Uh, the data with vaccinations and cases and fatalities, etc., don't uh, seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but where real estate's concerned, I think uh, fundamentally Sri Lanka's on a very good footing. Uh, we have a GDP of about $3,703 per capita, which is still the highest in South Asia, uh, all of the countries except for uh, Maldives. So whilst there are other investment destinations that FDI will look at um, in the next few years, Sri Lanka still offers an amazing option for real estate, for real estate investment. So we don't expect a major change in the fundamental long-term trends, but uh, it certainly is a bumpy ride um, for many of the segments at the moment. Uh, thanks again for Jules and the team. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. I've probably, over, probably gone over time, but yeah, Sharon will stop me. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Roshan. That's perfectly Thank all you right. And you covered uh, most of the very important areas of what's happening in Sri Lanka's real estate as well. So stay tuned and stay with us. And for those of you who joined us slightly late, that's all right. Um, thank you for joining us for a very insightful roundtable discussion. Uh, we have our panelists and we have one more panelist to cover the session. Uh, we see that there is a lot of questions being sent on the chat box. Uh, we would kindly request you to please send in in the Q&A section. As soon as we complete our next panelist, we'll be taking over uh, the questions that you have sent in. Uh, over 
over to our next speaker right now, and he's all set and ready. We're very honored to have with us uh, Mr. Mega Kularatna to talk to us on the, uh, the change that has actually transpired over office environment uh, to the building practices in Sri Lanka, all of this and much, much more. Um, Mr. Kularatna? Thank you very much, Sharon, and good morning to everyone. And thank you for uh, Property Group for organizing this very timely event. So I think uh, my topic today is to give a brief overview of the commercial or more specifically the office building landscape in Sri Lanka, and also our experience with respect to uh, property group and the word scheme. So I think uh, <clears throat> the topic is the future of office buildings in Sri Lanka and how aligned the sector is in terms of uh, sustainable development or more specifically uh, sustainable buildings or green buildings. I think the obviously the current context is <clears throat> the, uh, since 2020 has been the global pandemic and all the, uh, the and everyone has been reeling from the effects of COVID-19. So uh, with the concept of working from home coming into the fore. But I think to examine and answer this question fully uh, as with all, <clears throat> all uh, moments of crisis, we have to zoom out of the graph a little bit and go back to uh, uh, the Sri Lanka's recent history. I think Sri Lanka's economy, to give a brief, brief backdrop, doubled during the 10 year post war period from 2019 to 2000, 2009 to 2019, from around 40 billion to uh, presently around $85 billion. So I think it is really during this time that Sri Lanka's real estate market started to grow exponentially. Uh, the growth in the office space or commercials, commercial space has been less compared to the growth in the com condominium market. However, I think the supply has nearly doubled from around 4 million square feet of office space to 8 million during the last five years. And from these 8 million square feet, I think around one third of uh, the office space is what we can classify as A-grade office space which I will focus on. So presently we have about, uh, if uh, estimations are correct, around 2.5 million square feet of office space in Sri Lanka. And I think this is uh, very soon to exceed 3 million square feet with uh, several notable A-grade office space coming into, uh, coming into the picture like Havelock City, Shangri-La, I think this Shangri-La one is already completed. Then John Kill Cinema Life, and uh, MAGA also, that is our own office development, the second part of our office development complex. Added to this, there is also, uh, as Prashan mentioned, the unveiling of Port City, uh, which is, I think, uh, which through which the government intends to create a paradigm shift in the financial and commercial landscape of Sri Lanka. So, Port City, of course, as you may know, is in its entire, entirety a long-term initiative spanning 50 to 20 years. But I, I suppose we can assume that the first phase of Port City, which will play out in the next five years or so, if especially more multinational corporations look to set up their regional headquarters for financial or com and commercial operations in Sri Lanka, there will be a su substantial growth in Sri Lanka's office space uh, in around uh, Port City itself. Interestingly, I think personally, uh, <clears throat> the entry of Port City into the commercial space in Sri Lanka will also bring wider dividends to the rest of Colombo as well, where I believe players in the rest of Colombo who position themselves in the right way uh, will be able to capture the market. So <clears throat> what do we mean by this? I think uh, uh, as Roshan mentioned once again, the market has been getting increasingly competitive and the players have been struggling to survive, but they have done a good job. Uh, so I think uh, going into the future, it will be even more competitive. So the client focus from the clients will be on office space, which are more and more energy, energy efficient with lots of smart building capabilities, uh, you sort of uh, IoT or Internet of Things. Then uh, highly customizable uh, office space with open floor plans, uh, with opportunity to integrate their own interior designs. And finally, the right set of amenities, I think especially parking and building management system and so, so forth. 
So I think the developers who are able to offer these, <coughs> these features uh, will be able to position themselves in the right, if, and if they're able to position themselves in the right, right price bracket, we'll have a definite competitive advantage in the short to medium term in office space in Sri Lanka. So moving on to our personal experience, um, I represent Maga Engineering, which is the largest construction company in Sri Lanka. And we unveiled a 200,000 square feet A-grade office building in 2018, uh, which is in Colombo 5. So <clears throat> the building uh, won the best office development in Sri Lanka award in 2018. And uh, I think particularly it was a success story in that it was not located in the central business district of Colombo, like most other most of our most of our competition, but yet uh, we were able to attract blue chip companies and multinational corporations who wanted to set up their regional headquarters in Sri Lanka, as well as other uh, other um, startups and a lot of IT companies from Sri Lanka, for instance. So the winning the best office development in Sri Lanka, as as well as further recognition in the sphere of sustainability and green buildings also helps us helped us to get, get wider recognition amongst our peers and our clients in Sri Lanka. So moving on to uh, uh, the present building practices in Sri Lanka, <clears throat> I think if you, talk, if you talk of green buildings or sustainable buildings, uh, the adoption has been still a bit slow, I would say, especially compared to my more advanced uh, regional economies, especially in Southeast Asia, for instance. Having said that, uh, in 2009, nine, the Green Building Council in Sri Lanka was set up, and uh, the Sri Lanka Green Building Rate, uh, Green Sri Lanka Green Rating System was unveiled one year later. So, <clears throat> I think Sri Lanka Green Building Rating has benchmarked uh, lead standards and many <clears throat> other major green building standards in the world. And of course, it has fine-tuned or improved the standards to adjust to more, uh, to take in more local parameters and local conditions. So I think since 2010, I understand that more than 100 developers have applied for green building uh, standards through the Sri Lanka Green Rating System or Sri Lanka Green Building Council, and more than 50 buildings have been so far rated. Few other developers, uh, especially in the manufacturing sector, for instance, has also opted uh, to still go for lead ratings, and they have also been successful. So I think this is overall definitely uh, we are heading in the right direction, and I believe in the next five years uh, we would see wider adoption in this field. Uh, even we see today some public sector government buildings now requiring to incorporate certain green building standards through their procurement process. And uh, I think I would add that uh, if we can benchmark countries like Singapore and Australia, I think two countries which have been uh, real success stories in this whole <coughs> green building journey, especially primarily or primarily because they have been, bring, have been able to bring these standards into reg uh, regulations uh, from a very early stage. I remember, I think if you take Australia more than 15 years ago, and they have been they have managed to transform the construction building construction industry in those two countries. In terms of uh, wider uh, wider construction sector and the building for a green building future in Sri Lanka, green for a sustainable future in Sri Lanka, I think if we move beyond the building construction sector, there are still a lot of opportunities in the renewable energy sector in Sri Lanka as well as water supply sector, with the government aiming to have 70% uh, of their energy requirement to renewable sources by the year 2030, and also government planning to fulfill uh, that 100% of their drinking water uh, requirements, provide drinking water to all of Sri Lanka by 2025. So I think in conclusion, despite the difficulties experiencing experience represent, especially due to COVID-19. If you zoom out of the graph a little bit, I believe in the medium term and the long term, Sri Lanka is still positioned and aligned in the right way. Uh, as the government also highlighted uh, in the recent investor forum held virtually around two weeks ago, the government aims to double the GDP, the present GDP of around 90 billion uh, US dollars by, by 2030. 
So I think even if only part of this uh, gets actualized in the short term and the medium term, I think as Roshan highlighted, developers who lay the groundwork for <clears throat> sustainable products which are positioned the right way and which can come into the market in the year 2022 or 2023 would be positioned uh, to reap the benefits in the commercial sector of the country. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Mega Kularatna, Director of Finance and Planning, MAGA Engineering, winner of the special recognition in sustainable development to the Property Guru Asia Property Awards. We also would like to say thank you to all our industry experts for sharing their insights and also the excitement building up uh, towards the awards as well. We're going to commence now the Q&A session. We'd like to come very kindly invite you to drop in your questions in the Q&A section so that we can commence uh, with the Q&A session. Uh, some of the audience members' questions is what we're looking for. Thank you again for participating in our virtual roundtable today, hosted by Property Guru Asia Property Awards. Uh, we also would like to remind you to visit the newsroom on our asiapropertyawards.com website to view a summary of today's roundtable. Let's begin with the questions for today, and that's where uh, we'd like to start with our first one, which is, what are the new experiences the judges bring to the table this year to ensure utmost credibility in the selection process? A uh, question being sent by the Island newspaper. Thank you for your question. Um, we'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Nirmal or anyone from our panelists to answer this one. Sure, thanks, Sharon. I think it's an interesting point. Uh, if you look at, uh, the panel of judges uh, in the Sri Lankan edition, I believe they come with a great depth of experience, both locally and internationally, starting from a architectural background, design background, construction and real estate development background, transactional uh, advisory, real estate advisory services, consulting background, etc. And almost every judge has been involved in projects uh, both locally and internationally. So I think they have a wealth of experience. They've been there, done that, and worked with some of the most uh, top-notch developers in the region. So I think what they bring into the table is not only industry know-how, uh, the benchmarking at global standards, as well as innovative thinking uh, and trying to compare with what's happening in the region. Uh, and because there's a lot of interaction with uh, Property Guru on this, uh, I, as an example, interact a lot with the fellow chairpersons uh, in the other countries. And when we mingle around and when we discuss with them, we tend to understand what's happening at an industry level as well. So I think that's what we will be bringing once again uh, to the table this time in the overall judging process, because we need to also set very high standards around uh, because we, we've been able to win the coveted title of best of Asia in some of the categories. So we definitely need to up the ante and also ensure that this process helps each and every developer in Sri Lanka to reach higher global standards. Uh, so I think that's what we will uh, definitely work hard uh, in terms of achieving. And uh, we know for a fact that the local real estate industry also over the last five years has accepted that uh, norms and uh, they've also really worked hard towards meeting these global standards. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nirma. Uh, I think in relation to the first question, our next question is, how does the Sri Lankan market for property and real estate look for potential buyers and investors? Uh, Mr. Roshan, can I ask you to answer this one? Hi, yes. So did I understand the question correctly? How do the developers look for overseas buyers? How does the Sri Lankan market for property and real estate look for more potential buyers and investors? Okay, um, good question. Well, to be honest, uh, I don't think the Sri Lankan real estate market has ever really had any trouble finding investors, especially locally. Um, being an island, we exhibit many of the characteristics of other islands where real estate is only ever going in one direction, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Maldives, 
mile extension. So fortunately, we have that natural geographic advantage um, and the location and pretty much every inch of Sri Lanka is prime real estate in terms of beaches or you know uh, countryside, mountains, etc. I think really the, the challenge has always been to convince uh, overseas investors to come here. Uh, you know, if you take uh, Thailand, um, you guys obviously uh, are experts in that area. You, Thailand attracts a lot of foreign investment into property. Um, you know, when people visit Thailand, um, uh, they get a sense that it's a very nice holiday home place location and, and the Thai developers go out of their way to, uh, to make it attractive for people in Europe, for example, to, to have a holiday home in Thailand. I don't think Sri Lanka's quite taken that step. Uh, over the last six or seven years, we at RIU have been having investor forums at, uh, you know, in, at the Sri Lankan embassy in the UK and in Mali and other locations trying to put Sri Lanka on the map. Uh, we tried to have one at the Arab British Chamber of Commerce a few years ago, and uh, many of the Arab bankers there haven't really heard of Sri Lanka. So I think a lot of marketing needs to be done. Um, and uh, in the past, we've had policy inconsistency that has really deterred foreign investors from looking. But I think that has been sorted in the last year and a half, and the political environment looks quite stable. So. I think now is a good time um, and, and the new dawn after COVID, et cetera, I think presents some new opportunities there. I hope that covers it. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you very much uh, for sharing us that insight. Uh, Dr. Nirmal, I think you covered this in your presentation. Here's a question uh, which I would like to invite you or uh, maybe Mega or Dinu can also can respond to this one. Do you think there, that there will be an encouraging number of best development projects to be featured by designers and developers in Sri Lanka this year, for this year. Uh, before I start, Jules, would you like to add something on this first? Yeah, sure. I mean, and I think it's uh, definitely something that we are very encouraged by this year, probably more so than in the previous year, that we have already received a number of nominations from several developers. Uh, not only in Colombo, but also elsewhere in the country. So we are confident uh, that we will receive a lot of very strong entries this year before the September deadline, and that they will be of a standard that we're proud to showcase in terms of the quality and, of course, the resilience of, of the Sri Lankan real estate market. So, yes, looking forward to that. Yeah, if I may just add something uh, to that, Sharon, I think most of the developers have also seen real value in being part of the Asia Property Awards process. Uh, being recognized will definitely help them from a, a image and a sales and marketing perspective, but also help them to further improve their product and the service offering uh, in which they bring into the market. So I think they will definitely continue uh, to be encouraged by being part of a uh, global process, and we're looking forward to seeing the increase this year as well. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal. Um, the next question is, I like to know the background of the economy suffering due to COVID and most industries falling behind. How can you give a real picture of the property in the country for this year? Uh, could I ask uh, Dr. Nirmal or maybe even Dinuko Mega can give an update on that. Right, so I may, may start off, uh, Sharon. Uh, so I think, uh, irrespective of turbulent economic times, we've seen that real estate investment has been a, a great leveler when it comes to defend yourself with inflationary pressures. So most and uh, most people have looked at real estate investment as a very attractive asset class uh, to be in their investment portfolio. As I mentioned earlier in my uh, presentation, I think the monetary policy is the biggest driver towards real estate investment at the moment. Today, we can get a housing loan at around 7%. Uh, and more and more banks are coming with flexible repayment plans. 
So compared to putting your money in a fixed income tool like a fixed deposit that will generate around five, five and a half percent, we've seen that uh, investing in real estate has uh, real benefits. Also, if you look at central bank statistics on the land price index in Colombo and suburbs, we've seen approximately 9% growth year on year on a capital appreciation point of view. Of course, prior to 2019, we've seen it through 10, 11% levels, but now it's probably averaged out uh, to around 9% as per central bank statistics. Uh, so I think that is going to be a, a key driver. Secondly, from a COVID perspective, uh, the healthcare uh, initiatives that Sri Lanka has taken and how we overall manage this entire scenario is now creating uh, question marks in Sri Lankan diaspora, whether they should come back to Sri Lanka now. And I, I personally had many chats with Sri Lankan diaspora who says, uh, well, Sri Lanka, we need to come back uh, to retire over here once again. So we might see an influx of Sri Lankan diaspora also now wanting to invest their uh, money in Sri Lanka. So I think, uh, in my opinion, there is never a bad time to invest in real estate. Uh, it's just that you need to pick up the uh, right opportunities uh, at the right time. So I am quite bullish about the opportunities that exist in the marketplace. Also from a COVID perspective, if you are a small to medium-sized enterprise, most of the banks have been wanting collateral for any type of lending. And real estate is one such collateral that they can provide uh, for SME uh, requirements. And as you know, Sri Lanka's economy, almost 75 to 80 percent is driven by SME companies. So I think the demand for real estate will continue, even though uh, we are in somewhat of unprecedented times in our history. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharon, I mean, if I may add something there, I am a firm believer of, you know, there are opportunities in adversity. So there, and for sure, there, there are, you know, it's, it's a, the times are tough, uh, but it is not permanent. It is a, it's a temporary uh, setback. And I'm sure if you look at uh, how Europe and US is now recovering out of COVID, you see now, uh, yesterday I was watching some, uh, you know, football, the Euro uh, 2020 football games, uh, stadiums are packed again. And, you know, so, so generally we are about a two month time lag, lag be, you know, behind. So I think when our vaccinations uh, pick up, uh, we will also, as a as a nation, come out of uh, this. And we are currently struggling economic wise. Is our our struggles are mainly in terms of in in terms of uh, foreign exchange. That's our main uh, main issue at the moment. We, we we lack dollars, and the main reason for that is uh, uh, you know the lack of FBIs. Our work, worker remittances, because 60, 70,000 foreign overseas workers were, you know, they returned to Colombo. So they are not working now. So there is no remittances coming. And then, of course, tourism is at a, you know, at a, at a complete standstill. So no sooner things open up and when our, our uh, star, you know, uh, people start traveling uh, to all these uh, destinations, the remittances will start opening up. With tourism, along with tourism, FDIs will also will follow in, especially with uh, the port city now kicking in. Uh, I, I think there will be a lot of uh, interest in FDIs within the port city, uh, and that will be a huge uh, opportunity for us as a nation to uh, piggyback on that opportunity and recover sooner rather than later with, uh, with regard to foreign exchange. So there are opportunities in adversity. It's a temporary setback, uh, but I think it's the right time that we need to go ahead and programs like this is a fantastic uh, uh, boost to the pr property industry and to take it forward. Thank you, Dinoka. Mega, do you want to add anything? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Sharon. I think to what uh, Nirmal and Dinoka added, I would also like to highlight a very interesting fact, which is that uh, Colombo has been growing. Uh, there's been a lot, lot of development in and around Colombo. Despite this fact, I think uh, more and more we find that a lot of people are priced out of living in Colombo, especially uh, which is um, 
which is very important for a growing city. If you analyze the other growth economies in the region, they, they, they have centered around the capital. So I think more and more what has happened in Colombo is that the land prices have uh, really shot up and therefore uh, the middle, middle class has been, have been priced out of Colombo. I think the, there's great opportunity for developers, especially to look into this price, uh, price bracket and also to develop uh, housing to suit uh, these people who are daily commuting maybe one hour or, or more to Colombo. I think there, are, there have been three more bottlenecks if I could highlight in terms of infrastructure, public transport, and also, as uh, Nirmal mentioned about the monetary policy, I think these have been slowly getting cleared, especially also the infrastructure network around Colombo uh, will improve in the next five years. I think with this, uh, the property market also has to uh, broad-based themselves, not just to cater to the high-end market, but also to cater to low-income low and mid-income housing within Colombo, which will, I think, be uh, big, which should play a big part in the development of Colombo in, in, in the next five years. Uh, thank you, Mega. Thank you to the three of you for giving that very valuable if insight. If I could just add something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, to, um, from a, uh, just to add to what Mega was saying, uh, from an investor's perspective, uh, it, it's actually um, an opportune time to invest now because the next generation of apartments in particular are not going to be available at the same price for multiple reasons cost of raw materials, uh, new import restrictions, uh, the difference in currency, um, the currency depreciation means that uh, uh, Sri Lanka is going to be paying more for its imported finishes, for example. So essentially, the next generation of apartment buildings uh, will be that much more expensive pricey. So um, that set against the backdrop of increasing absorption because over the last one and a half, two years, we haven't seen many new projects being launched, very few in fact, um, whilst sales have been taking place. So the absorption level of the existing inventory is actually very high. So at, at, at some point very soon, we're gonna have a market where we will have uh, a shortfall of supply perhaps, which was unheard of, uh, which unthinkable certainly three or four years ago, but now that's a real possibility. So the price pressure is going to be upward um, there. So it, it is a good time to invest for sure. Uh, Roshan, very similar to that, I think we have a question on, I, I, I suppose you can answer this as well. How do you view the impact of increasing value of the dollar versus the rupee on real estate and construction market? I know you just covered it, uh, but a little bit of a refresher because I think the exporters are also struggling uh, to bring the raw materials, like you very rightly said. Uh, but things are moving here as well here at home. And uh, Mega, may you you may also comment on this area. Yeah, I think Mega would be uh, in the front line uh, uh, there in terms of a developer who obviously imports materials and finishes. Uh, but from our perspective, um, is one of the reasons why we find that the diaspora interest uh, in the local property market is currently still very high, uh, because if you can imagine. Uh, something that was going to cost you, say, 300,000 US dollars uh, two years ago may only cost you about 250,000 US dollars now. So uh, it's become that much more affordable if you're earning in foreign currency. Uh, I'd also like to add that uh, as, um, as uh, the expert panel has mentioned, foreign currency is a big issue in Sri Lanka. So the government and, and even the commercial banks have um, in place many incentives for people uh, living and working overseas to, to, uh, to invest in property in Sri Lanka by making bank accounts that um, kind of um, are tailor-made to their needs uh, and, and make it possible for them to pay in dollars, uh, borrow locally, etc. So the number of uh, schemes that are available for the diaspora and foreign investors are a little bit better than they were a few years ago. Uh, so that is an opportunity on the one hand, but certainly a cost if you're a developer. Um, yeah. Hope that helps. 
Mega, would you like to add? Um, I think as a contractor primarily and also a part developer, I think it has been a constant struggle uh, for the construction industry to keep uh, this pricing down, especially given the we are de so dependent on uh, global impacts. Um, so I think uh, also the tax structure in terms of building materials in Sri Lanka historically has not helped. I think the government uh, is in the process of looking at some of these areas. Of course, um, despite that, I think a um, lot of contractors and developers have succeeded, I would say, to sell, uh, as Roshan men mentioned, uh, and, to, and to survive in the last few years. So going forward, I think this also it acts as a double-edged sword in the sense wherein uh, <clears throat> people who are investing from overseas are still able to afford uh, pri uh, prices in terms of uh, dollars. So I think uh, it works both ways in, in some instances. Going forward, I think we, the industry also has to look at improving uh, their, cost, their efficiencies and productivity and adopting other technologies in order to bring this construction cost down. Thank you, Mega. Thank you for sharing us that. Um, Jules, I'd like to get your insights on this question. Um, slightly tricky, but uh, from an international perspective, you can probably give some, a, a good viewpoint on this. Um, Sri Lanka's real estate industry seemingly catering towards luxury and local buyers and foreign investors. And however, there is a greater potential in the mid-range markets. But as an organization, how encouraging is property guru towards mid-range buyers and instilling ideals for increasing mid-range real estate development, uh, whereby local market opens up? How do you see this? And I'd like to get uh, viewpoints from our panelists as well. Yeah, well, from, from an awards perspective, uh, we are definitely very encouraging of the mid-range market. I mean, what we look for and what our judges are, are given to, to, to assess is quality, right? And that doesn't matter whether it's at the top end of the market or the affordable end of the market or the mid-range market. Uh, we actually, if you, if you look at the categories that we cover across the region, we go from very, very affordable right up to ultra luxury. And quite often the, the bulk of our the properties that enter for the awards on an annual basis are in that mid-range category. So really that's in many ways where it becomes more useful for developers to distinguish themselves uh, against the competition. So entering an award and, and being, being rewarded or being, being given an award helps them to stand out from other mid-range projects. So yes, we're very encouraging of that. We do see the value of the real estate industry, not only from an international perspective, but also from a domestic perspective. And we try to encourage quality across the board uh, by judging fairly and, and openly uh, based on the actual project itself. And the categories I think you'll see will match that. I think Nirmal can back that up as well from a judge's yeah. perspective. Yeah, Dr. Nirmal? Yeah, so I think, uh, Sharon, just like any other industry, uh, if you are to be successful, you need to identify the gaps in the marketplace. And it's very clear that the other panelists also exemplify this the fact that there is a huge demand in suburban areas of Sri Lanka, where more and more people are commuting there, uh, living there, and there is a real demand for housing uh, and real estate solutions. Similarly, there seems to be a huge opportunity for affordable and middle tier living as well as tier B and tier C type of commercial real estate as well, because majority of the uh, real demand for commercial real estate has been coming from the technology, BPO and professional services sectors. Uh, and uh, for them, majority of them, they'll be not looking at a A-grade building, but maybe a B-grade building, uh, et cetera. Now, interestingly, this is where competition comes into play as well. The government of Sri Lanka has also now tried to play an active role in this by coming up with 4,000 approximately uh, middle-income housing to play a major role to fulfill that gap. So, which means from a private sector perspective, developers really need to up the ante now if they are to capitalize on the gap in the marketplace. So we are there for interesting times. Just because it's in the middle income category or affordable category does not mean that there can be any compromise on quality. 
uh, and we've seen many development projects across the region, even on the uh, Property Guru, Asia Property Watch platform, uh, that they're really top notch. They've used sustainable building materials. They come up with different engineering and construction standards, really pushing in to create that differentiation required uh, to be the best of the best. So I think it's a matter of time. Sri Lankan developers have now looked into it. Uh, we, we've spoken to many developers for the last few years who started doing their research and development towards those areas. And we've seen some of them being very bold enough to take that first move advantage. Uh, so yeah, definitely that's going to be an interesting space. All right, thank you, Dr. Nirma. Uh, the next question will be to Roshan and Mega. Since the pandemic uh, has opened up an enormous number of opportunities for businesses to adapt to a hybrid work model, what advice can you give the building owners to make the most of increasing vacant spaces? Roshan? Okay, I was hoping Mega would take that one, but all right. Um... Well, um, work from home is something, it's not anything new. Um, we, in our company, we've had it uh, for the last three or four years. Um, and certainly with the number of internal shocks that we have in this part of the world, uh, it's a good thing to have. And in our business, we can, we've had a four day week for most of our people for the last two or three years. Um, that's more due to things like, you know, growing congestion, uh, the time it takes to get to office in Colombo has uh, pretty much doubled over the last five or six years. Uh, so <clears throat> in terms of the way we work, um, uh, what we've seen is the, the dawn of the pandemic has pretty much accelerated a trend which we were expecting, but it's just literally uh, uh, left by five years of what we thought where would we where would we where we would be. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not one of these people who I don't think is gonna be a revolutionary change. Uh, it's more of a reform, I think. Uh, we, for certain, we had a little internal discussion and we, we had a vote on who wants to work from home more than two, more than one day a week and it was like 10%. So most people still want that office, I think is important for an organization to build this culture, uh, you know, people like interns are never going to really learn about the work environment if they are constantly working from home. So we feel it's not going to be a revolution, but a reform in terms of how developers can adapt. I think um, uh, the Roshan. Until I get Roshan back, Mega, would you like to add to that? Uh, I think I would, uh, in large part, agree with Roshan, and I would even maybe go a step further. I think uh, <clears throat> there's still not enough visibility in terms of uh, how quickly we can return to normal, maybe six months, one year, or maybe longer. But I think whenever that happens, I do think uh, a lot of businesses would want to work in, new technology, work in office. Work Roshan, sorry, we lost you there. So uh, we wanted uh, Mega to answer in. <laughs> sorry, well, I rest my case. Work from home sucks. <laughs> so we're going to go back to the office. Uh, Mega, yeah. Yes, uh, so I think um, um, when we do uh, go back to the full normal operations, I think a lot of employers, a lot of companies would want to want their employees to work in offices. And as Roshan said, to build that, uh, you know, um, the company culture and office culture. And also I think um, historically we have, not, we have seen uh, when there's been a, a incident or a global pandemic like this or any other catastrophic event, there has been a period of large, a period of large growth or a boom. So I think when that sets in, a lot of businesses will find that a more economic activity is naturally generated. They have to they have to cope up with that, and then naturally, uh, the work in office spaces will increase and go back to normal or even exceed what was uh, before before the pandemic. Uh, Doctor Nirman, 
Yes. Yeah. Can I just add something on that? Going by the question, I think there was yeah. one area which probably did not get addressed. Uh, in terms of if you're a typical landlord or a developer holding commercial and retail real estate, what are some of the actions that you need to be taking at this point of time? I'll take it from the restaurant industry. Most of the restaurant industry now is moving into cloud kitchen type of a concept or trying to share their kitchen spaces in order to optimize their cash flows. Similarly, I think commercial real estate developers will need to look at their formats on their floor plans. Gone are the days where you can rent out or lease out a full flow. You might need to bring it into three or four different layouts in a typical flow to help the smaller office space demand. Uh, and also they need to look at gap type of renting, uh, a notion that Sri Lankan developers really do not like to do because they want fixed income coming in in terms of their lease rental cash flows. But there are times where you can gap your rent because the vacancy period in Sri Lanka is very low for commercial real estate, especially wherever there is demand. So as a result of that, if you take the vacancy out, gap your rental over the entire tenure, even during shocks like this, you may not have a huge cash flow impact uh, coming into your uh, PNL. So I think real estate developers, commercial real estate players will need to look at some of the best practices adopted in uh, regional areas as well as in the international domain to see on how they can change their business model slightly. Gone are the days where you can just give a space, rent it out and collect. Now people are looking at integrated facilities management, looking at uh, flexible workspaces, looking at uh, additional support services that commercial landlords can provide. I think that's where uh, the Sri Lankan market will be moving towards. And, and the players who jump on that bandwagon earlier will definitely have a sustainable competitive advantage, uh, in my humble opinion. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal. And uh, I believe that's all the time that we have for our Q&A session. And we certainly hope that we, we've answered most of your questions satisfactorily. But if you are interested in getting more information, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to um, organize ourselves with uh, some of the panelists and we'll make sure that they get in touch with you and help you out in some of the queries that you have. Thank you to our panelists once again. Uh, before we go, we'd like to thank you individually to the Managing Director of Property Guru Asia Property Awards and Events, Director and CEO of Paramount Reality, and the Chairperson of Judges Property Guru Asia Property Awards, Dr. Nirmal De Silva, Founding Director and CEO of Real Real Estate Intelligence Unit and Judging Panel of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards, Mr. Roshan Madhavala, Managing Director for NH and Co, CEO and Director, RNH Group of Companies, HLB Sri Lanka, and the Official Supervisor of Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka, Mr. Dinuk Hetiarachi, and Director Finance and Planning Maga Engineering and winner of the Special Recognition in Sustainable Development Development Property Guru Asia Property Awards 2018, Mr. Ratna. And once again, a big thank you to the managing director, Mr. Jules K, for hosting the event and also um, making sure that Sri Lanka comes back um, to where its strength is. Um, before we wind up, uh, just like to have a quick word, any final thoughts from our panelists today? Jules, would you like to start? I think pretty much what we've heard from the panelists, it seems like, you know, Sri Lanka has been very resilient and developers in the country are looking to bounce back strong with a, with a lot of very smart strategies, exposing themselves more online, you know, continuing with projects, the government supporting them with, with inter interest rate cuts. I think we can look forward to a successful future. And with big projects like Port City starting to open up again, I think uh, we're feeling very confident that Sri Lanka will make a mark not only in the awards, but in the region uh, going forward. Looking forward to being part of that and supporting that. Dr. Nirmal, as the chairperson of the judges. Yeah, I echo with Jules sentiment. I think Sri Lanka is a resilient na a nation. Our history proves how resilient we are. Uh, I think now it's the opportunity for Sri Lankan developers and entrepreneurs and the whole corporate sector, including public policy makers, to think out of the box. I think it's very critical for us to have the right 
positive mindset to look at opportunities in the marketplace we can ponder about the challenges but that will not take us anywhere uh, we are in a very globalized competitive environment so we need to keep our eyes and ears open for what's happening uh, i'm a true believer on the notion that sri lanka can uh, we have a, a one dream one vision and we can definitely make it one reality i wish everybody all the best in terms of their submissions i'm pretty sure that uh, we will see some really good uh, uh, applications nominations coming up and we will be amidst the best of the best once again in asia um until such time i want to all of you all stay safe uh, and uh, best wishes thank you doctor uh, mr roshan manavala any final thoughts as a judge transparency is key but there's a lot of work Certainly, yes. Uh, yeah, we will endeavor to um, study all the projects and uh, give our feedback as always. Um, and always happy to work with you guys. Um, as a side note to what Dr. Nirmal has said, I think we can agree that the future isn't uh, as bleak. It's not going to be as bleak as the last uh, 18 months. We, we do expect things to really pick up. I am really excited about, I think, the prospects of tourism um, opening up and the, the, the talk of oversupply, which was there three, four years ago in real estate is obviously now vanished. And uh, it's an exciting time for developers as well. Housing uh, demand will stay steady. And I think it's time to, for investors and developers to be courageous, uh, have faith and uh, hope for the best. I mean, in terms of the statistics in Sri Lanka, you still have a much higher probability of being hit by a bus than um, succumbing to COVID. Um, so statistically speaking, I think there's a tendency to see things as much worse than they really are. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, as, as we said, uh, 2022 and certainly 2023 is going to be amazing. Um, this year will be a struggle for some, but others are doing perfectly okay. Uh, residential in particular are surviving well. Thank you. That's and thanks again for you guys for organizing this thing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roshan. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to now invite the HLB Sri Lanka, the official supervisor of Property Guru Asia Property Awards, the managing partner, NH and co CEO and director, RNH Group of Companies, uh, Mr. Dinu Ketiarachi. Any final thoughts? You're a part uh, of this entire project. Yeah, so um, I concur with all the other sentiments uh, already expressed and do not want to uh, repeat the same, but I would also uh, invite all property developers in Sri Lanka to uh, apply for the awards uh, and uh, we will, as the supervisor, ensure that uh, the process will be just and fair and that is our role and we will ensure that uh, that remains in place. And I'm sure that, uh, like I said earlier, I'm a firm believer of opportunities in adversity. And I'm quite sure that Sri Lanka will kind of bounce back strongly. And uh, once again, thank you to Property Guru for staying on course and making sure that the award ceremony goes on as scheduled, of course, in a different format this year, but still things like this will help our country come out of it uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you once again, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Megakula Ratna? Yes, I think as others highlighted, uh, what Sri Lanka offers as a country, I think has, has not changed despite uh, all the external <clears throat> difficulties we've had. And this, will, this potential still remains, remains. And also as a country, what we offer in terms of nature, beauty, culture, and also economic opportunities, these can only be unearthed, I think, if we have uh, a medium-term or long-term plan to uh, work towards that. If you look at the budget last year, I think the policy consistency has been slowly introduced now for the next five or 10 years. So I think as uh, individually and as collectively as an industry, I think we, we should set ourselves some targets in terms of where we want to be and uh, diligently work towards them. I think then uh, the entire industry and the country at large would... Uh, would uh, reap the benefits. Thank you very much once again for organizing the event. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kularatna, and to all our panelists for joining us for today. In conclusion, as we've come to the close of the virtual roundtable, we would like to acknowledge the support of our esteemed partners once again. Official Supervisor, HLB, Official Magazine, Property Guru, Property Report, Official Cable TV Partner, History Channel, Official Newspaper, Delhi FT, Supporting Association, Salon Institute of Builders, Official PR Partner, PR Wire Consultancy, official charity partner, Right to Play, and official ESG partner, Barn Deck Foundation. Thank you very much for partnering with us. And before concluding, we would like to remind everyone of our entry timeline and key dates for Property Guru Asia Property Awards 2021. It's up on your screen now. And the presentation of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards Sri Lanka will be streamed across multiple channels, including asiapropertyawards.com slash newsroom, the official Facebook and YouTube channels on Thursday, 9th December 2021, and to be immediately followed by the Regional Property Guru Asia Property Awards Grand Final. We look forward in seeing you there. And so thanks very much to each and every one of you for your questions and for your time for joining us on our virtual roundtable today for the fifth annual Property Guru Asia Property Award Sri Lanka 2021. Please feel free to send in your inquiries to the email on the screen and stay connected to Property Guru Asia Property Award social media channels. For more information, please visit www.asiapropertyawards.com. On behalf of Property Guru Asia Property Awards team, I'm Sharon Mascarini is thanking you for your participation today and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Stay safe and I will one.